Hi, I'm Mrs. Brandy here reading more of Chasing Vermeer by Blue Belliet. We are now in chapter 19, The Shock on the Stairs. Mine starts on page 188. Get ready to follow along. After their visit with Mrs. Sharp and the news about Frog, Petra and Calder couldn't wait to get back to the search. The only remaining part of the university school compound that had paneling was King Hall. Remember to look at your King Hall, number four. Oh, that's the one right behind the school, right? The middle school and the high school buildings were too new, and Poppy Field Hall had been carved up into studio and theater spaces. Used only for college classes and offices, King Hall was practically empty after school. Starting on the first floor, Petra and Calder worked their way upstairs. There seemed to be miles of dark wood. Leaving the lights out, they ran their hands along square panels in lecture rooms, tapping softly and looking for hidden compartments. They opened closets and cupboards, but all were empty. They leaned on grates and rattled bulletin boards. The building seemed discouragingly solid. This place is dead compared with Delia Hall, Calder said, looking out at the bright building across the street. Completed in 1916, Delia Dell Hall boasted countless gargoyles and faces half hidden in decades of ivy. There were stone turrets, an assortment of chimneys, and casement windows. In addition to the original rooms, it had a pool, a pub, and a modern movie theater. Parties and performances were held there. The building cast a warm yellow glow on the snow, a glow that sent fingers of light into the dark classrooms of King. So much for my you for the you school pentomino idea, Petra said, standing next to Calder at the window. Guess she's not here. How about a quick look in Delia Dell before we go home? Sure, plus we can get M&Ms there and I'm starving. Their voices faded into the early darkness as they headed across the street, leaving the quiet of King Hall to resettle behind them. Calder and Petra sat on the long bench on the first floor of Delia Dell, sharing blue ones and a bag of potato chips. Snow was falling, magically softening and erasing the university world beneath it. They piled jackets and hats and gloves into a damp mound beside them. On the second, oops, I'm about to skip a page. Several college students on the other side of the room were talking about a Latin class. A man with heavy eyebrows sat reading a newspaper. A professor with a head like a pink bowling ball hurried in the direction of the pool, a towel under his arm. A woman carrying a giant ring of keys passed their bench and headed up the stairs. Calder could hear the sharp click of a door opening and the thunk of a, of a lock sliding into place from inside. Petra didn't seem to notice any of this. She was eating steadily, looking straight ahead of her with a sleepy expression. Calder was feeling talkative. Wow, this whole place is wood. Look at that staircase. I've never really noticed it before. It looks like something from an old movie. You know, like Betty Davis should be standing at the top. Right, Petra stood up and stretched. Come on, it's getting late. Away from the entrance hall, they wandered through room after empty room of paneled wood, stone fireplaces, tiled floors. They stayed in the older parts of the building. Neither had realized how big the original part of Delia Dell Hall was. It twisted and turned gracefully, a rectangular dance with surprises in scale and mood. One moment it was grand, the next cozy. There was a huge ballroom space on the first floor, with a Tai Chi class going on in one corner. Across the way was a miniature reception room, followed by what looked like a dining room. Plaster grapevines, <laughs> Plaster grapevines covered the heavy beams overhead, and the walls, paneled in rectangles of various sizes, varying sizes, were interrupted here and there by almost invisible doors. A small wooden knob and keyhole were the only indications that something might be up. One door led to an old-fashioned kitchen, one to a back staircase, and three or four others were simply locked. The dining area opened into a sunny library with a generous fireplace. Over the mantel, a wooden scroll read, dedicated to the life of women at the University of Chicago. Carved lions and horses flanked the dedication. Petra stood in front of it, admiring the elaborate Gothic letters. Cool, 
I wonder what that means. My mom told me that this, this was the first place at the university where women students could hang out. Anyway, Calder said, let's keep going. On the second floor, there were some offices and three empty lecture rooms, all with rows of wooden chairs, old oil paintings on the walls, and elaborate leaded glass windows. The third, room, third floor had a miniature theater. The walls of the room facing the theater were covered with a parade of young people in medieval costumes, dancing, playing, and talking with one another in an idyllic country setting. The north wall had vaulted windows with French doors that opened onto a roof terrace. Petra and Calder stood awed at this entrance to the room. A red velvet curtain covered the stage and on either side was a small wooden door. Propelled by the same urge, they walked slowly toward the stage. There was no one in sight. Without a word, Calder tried the door on the right-hand side. It opened. Three short steps led up to a tiny backstage area. They crept inside, stepping over frayed curtain ropes, a lute with no strings, a plastic pitcher, and an old broom. These look like props from a goofy Vermeer, for a goofy Vermeer, Calder said. He thought Petra would smile, but she didn't seem to be listening. Not much place to hide, was all she said. Petra suddenly felt as though she had forgotten something important, or as if she was supposed to be someplace but couldn't quite remember where. Or maybe it was that she didn't feel well. It was an effort to talk. Back on the second floor, she wandered over to a window seat and sat down. Being next to a casement window felt oddly comforting. Calder was down in all fours looking up into the fireplace. I'm just checking for hidden shelves. This building could be filled with secrets we haven't even imagined, you know? Hearing no response, he peered around at her. What's the matter? You look like you're half asleep. Calder, these windows. Calder sat up. Yeah, he said slowly, kind of like Vermeer windows. Petra looked around the room and the paneled wood. I mean, millions of old buildings have paneled wood, but these rectangles? Petra's voice trailed off and she stared at her reflection in the darkening glass. Calder came over and sat down quietly next to her. Do you want to look around some more? He asked, sounding like his parents when they were trying to get him to do something but didn't want to be too obvious. Petra looked steadily at him. Calder, what are you thinking? That you sound like we might be getting warm. Petra was suddenly feeling horribly warm. I might just be getting sick. Come on, let's get out of here. They headed back to the first floor. They passed the weasels that became brass door handles, the carved flute player overhead, the stone lions mounted high over the above the landing. Petra rested her hand on the railing as they walked slowly down the sweeping staircase, stopped with a jolt. Calder kept going. The railings were a delicate tangle of iron grapevines and creatures. There were birds, mice, and lizards. Instead of newel posts at the bottom of the staircase, an intricately carved oak monkey clung to either end of the rail. Monkey, panel, vines, flutes, vines. She could feel the blood beating wildly in her temple. Monkey, vines, monkey, vines, panel, flute, vines, vines. Mrs. Sharp's words. Petra stood frozen, one hand gripping the railing. She saw Calder pawing obliviously through their soggy clothing for his jacket. She hoped her face wasn't revealing her wild, screaming thoughts. Walk, just walk normally. A man looked up at her as she passed, putting down his paper. Was the world able to feel her heart pounding? Was her thoughts on fire? She grabbed her things and burst out the door into the merciful dusk. Petra, what's up? Come on. Calder could hardly keep up with his friend as she half ran, half stumbled through the new snow. She hurried a block east on 59th Street and glanced back. Calder looked back too, suddenly frightened. Let's go home through backyards. We need to disappear, okay? Calder walked quickly next to Petra, their shoulders touching. He thought of the P for prey, or was it prey? The blue shadows of late afternoon were menacing now. Bushes between houses seemed filled with pools of darkness, and people hunched against the cold looked people hunched against the cold looked dangerous. When she was satisfied that they weren't being followed, Petra stopped. Called her, this is it. He looked around at the deserted alleyway and shivered. This is what? I think we found her. End of time. What do you think?